Good evening and welcome to the ICA webinar, which has been which has been conducted every Wednesday without fails since the last one year. Actually, more than one year. I welcome you to this um, meeting. And today's topic is risk assessment in anesthesia and critical care. Whenever we do something, we always uh, look at the risk and benefit. And if the benefit is greater than the risks, then we go ahead with it. And uh, to assess the risk, we have several tools available to us. So I would like to, uh, I would request the faculty to dwell upon this matter and give us the current information. And uh, to start with, I would like to introduce Dr. Manjula Sarkar, who is a professor in anesthesiology at the DY Patil Medical College in Mumbai. She is very well known and uh, a prolific speaker and author. And then we have Dr. Poonam Malhotra, who is a professor at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She's uh, an expert in cardiac anesthesia and transesophageal echocardiography and ECMO. Then we have Dr. Ganapati Aramugam, another star from the South India. Uh, he is a senior consultant in Apollo Hospital, Chennai, and uh, he uh, has several accolades. And with this uh, brief introduction of the panelists and moderators, I throw open this uh, webinar and invite Dr. Manjula Sarkar, Poonam and Ganapati to carry on. Dr. Manjula Sarkar, please. Uh, thank you, sir, for a uh, kind uh, introduction of mine to this uh, forum. And without delaying, I would like to call upon the first speaker of the day, Dr. Klossel. As Sir said that risk scoring in anesthesia is really important to assess the patient's outcome. Dr. Klossel is going to talk on ASA physical status classification system, how this system is going to be beneficial for us for the patient outcome. Dr. Klossel, you can share here. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, we can. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, thank you for the Indian College uh, of Anesthesiologists for inviting me. And um, I would like to um, talk a little bit about uh, the ASA physical status classification system, the complex of risk. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm just going to go over here. And uh, I have no financial relationships or conflicts of interest to disclose. And without further ado, um, let's take a look at the objectives. So what I would like to do today is I would like to define some important contents of a risk classification system and kind of put them in context with the ASA physical status classification system and see how well it performs and how well it is it can be helpful for us. We are going to examine briefly the original purpose of the ASA physical status classification system and go into development over time and its current use. And then we're going to look at the um, value of the ASA physical status classification system as an actual risk predictor. And that's an important part because we'll talk a little bit about uh, its use in, in looking at outcomes in general, but also how it helps us for an individual patient and whether it helps us for an individual patient. And this is essentially my first question. And this is the most um, difficult part because by the end of this talk, and I don't want to kind of spoil the surprise, but by the end of this talk, I really want to put the ASA physical status uh, classification system into perspective and potentially even encourage you for individual to actually look at other validated risk prediction systems. And why is that? Because we know that for large aggregate data, the SAPS performs to a certain degree pretty well. 
But when we look at the individual patient risk predictions, not the best to have. And to kind of develop why, what is what is the issue with that? So let's take a look at what makes a good risk prediction system in the first place. And I would argue that if we look at a successful risk prediction system, we have different three different large factors that go into that. One would be patient-related factors, procedure-related factors, and then kind of like care team facility-related factors. So patient-related factors, functional status, frailty, comorbidities, the patient going into it, and then the immediate health step. Somebody who comes to us um, with a very significant massive bleed is going to be a different risk cat category than uh, somebody who who doesn't. Um, in terms of sorry, in terms of procedure, it depends on what kind of procedure we're looking at, how invasive this particular procedure is, and what's the urgency. We know from a lot of risk prediction systems that emergency surgery typically carries a much higher risk than our regular elective procedure that we're planning. And then lastly, I would make the point of the importance of the care team and facility. So the level of specialization. So you will have a different risk for a patient who undergoes a surgery on a tertiary care center versus in a freestanding M surgery center. Then the experience of the surgeon as well as the physiologist, and I would even tell you the managing team is going to be important. And then lastly, um, the availability of equipment and additional, you know, like uh, consulting resources can can modify risk in general. <coughs> okay, so how is the ASA physical status classification system currently being used at this point? They, it actually has a couple of different uses. So when we look from the clinical perspective, it helps us to communicate with other anesthesia providers. So when I give my sign out to my colleague, and I preface the sign out with this is an ASA4 patient, person will completely react differently than if I say it's an ASA1 patient. It can be used to, for uh, staff assignment and assignment of procedure location. So for example, certain, um, certain groups use the ASA to determine whether a patient can be taken care of in a freestanding ambulatory surgery center or if it needs to be a hospital procedure. And an outcome predictor. An outcome predictor, we'll talk a little bit more in this talk here in a second. It has administrative use. So it's often used to actually compare hospital performance. So let's say people want to look at outcomes for colon surgery. And somebody might argue, well, our hospital takes care of sicker patients. So our outcomes are necessarily not as good as the other hospitals. So the ASA can help us tabulate and look at um, what kind of comorbidities and what how sick patients certain hospitals take care of. Now, this is another big part business. So the ASA has been integrated in a lot of billing, um, uh, in a lot of kind of billing uh, algorithms, and it is a billing modifier for certain insurance companies. And then lastly, research. So there's very, very few papers that do not have like a tabulation of ASA to kind of give the reader an idea and an appreciation of what kind of patient population that paper examines. Now, here's an interesting um, turn to my talk. So to again, to give you the appreciation of why I would even say at some point to not necessarily use the ASAPS as a primary risk classification system, I want to go briefly into the history and give you an idea of how that system actually came to be. And that will be helpful for the discussion. So the history of the ASA system began around 1940, where the American Society of Anesthesiologists established a committee um, consisting of Sackler, Taylor, and Rovenstein. And the goal of this committee was to study, examine, experiment, and devise a system for the collection and tabulation of statistical data in anesthesia. And that's important. So it was really a system developed to just collect and tabulate statistical data, not to do any risk prediction. In 1941, the classification system um, was published with six designations. And if you look at those designations, they are very, very similar to the ones we have today, although there are certain important differences. For example, there were six classes, and then emergency surgery was denoted as class five or class six. But otherwise, it um, looks quite similar. Now, if you go to 1961, Drips and colleagues pu published a paper, The Role of Anesthesia in Surgical Mortality. And for this paper, the group created a new 
system based on Sacklet's original system. And this system really looks like the one we have with like slight modifications. So ASA1, uh, normal healthy patient, ASA5, a more bone patient. Now, in 1962, that five category was adopted by the ASA House of Delegates. And there was a resolution that this system is going to be carried further, um, further from here on on. And it was published in the ASA newsletter and an anesthesiology journal. And then, since then, there have been like smaller modifications. So in 1981, there was a small modification that changed the ASA 5 from a patient that is not expected to survive 24 hours with or without the operation to a morbid patient who is not expected to survive without the operation. So a small change in the wording. 1983 saw the uh, addition of a sixth category, ASA6, a declared brain dead patient whose organs are being removed for donor purposes. And then the most recent two modifications came about in 2014, where patient examples were added to the ASA system to help um, people to kind of categorize uh, patients a little better. And then back in 2020, there were pediatric and obstetric patient examples added for each category. And that leaves us with what we have nowadays. This is something that um, can be accessed at the ASA website. And as you can see here, we have our classifications, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we have a good amount of examples added, adult examples, pediatric examples, and obstetric examples. And that's the current system that we're using clinically in the operating room. Okay, so what's so interesting about the historical perspective? Why did I um, make you watch me talk to all of those? The reason is that the original intent of Sacklet, Taylor, and Rovenstein, who back in 1940 formulated the system, was never to be to use it as a risk prediction tool. It was, again, a statistical tabulation of things. And so, interestingly, Sacklet, back in 1941, kind of recognized that the system could be used to determine operative risk or anesthetic risk. And he, in his publication, directly commented on that. And I read that, I will read that from here. The attempt to determine a patient's operative risk may be of value in prognosis, but such grading of patient is useless from a statistical point of view. It is useless from several standpoints, the excessive number of variables to be considered, the tremendous degree of variation in different clinics and different physicians, and the complete lack of agreement as to definition of terms. So he already recognized that a good risk predictor has a couple of other things that should flow into it to give you um, the best individualized risk that you can get. And so the ASA physical status classification system is designed to only look at the patient factors. So we want to know what the patient's physical status is at the time you as the anesthesiologist see the patient before the patient goes to the operating room. But there shouldn't be any procedure related factors or any care team or facility related factors go into that decision what ASA classification this patient gets um, assigned. Okay. So to compare this very briefly to other risk prediction tools, validated risk prediction tools that are out there. So the RCRI, the um, American College of Surgeon NISQIP risk calculator, the STS risk calculator, and the PPOSM. What you're going to see here, a very, very usual trend is all of those risk prediction systems have multiple patient related factors. So it can be age, it can be heart disease, it can be lung disease, many, many different things. But every all every one of those risk prediction tools in some way carries the type of procedure or operative sever severity. And many of them also include emergency case classification. So again, somebody who comes from an emergency case is a much higher risk for a problematic outcome. Okay, so knowing that the ESA physical status classification system is originally not designed to function as a risk prediction tool, how does it actually perform if we make it a risk prediction tool? So interestingly, the physical status is definitely associated with post-operative outcome. So Drips and colleagues in their uh, 60s paper found a strong correlation of the ESA physical status and post-operative mortality. Now, when you look at that still, positive predictive value of the ASA class for postoperative mortality is very low, meaning that it is true that most of the time 
a very sick and bad looking patient like an ASA4 or ASA5, a, lo a certain amount of those people die during the procedure or post-operatively or have bad outcomes, complications, morbidity. But just being an ASA4 doesn't necessarily predict on an individual base that you will have that bad outcome. And to illustrate this, this is a table taken from publication uh, from Hackett and colleagues. And um, Hackett looked at the American College of Surgery uh, NISC database. This is an equality improvement project for surgery. And they actually looked at 2.2, almost 2.3 million patients and looked at uh, complications and death rates. And as you can see here from the um, tabulation is that it's true. An ASA status 5 patient will have a 71% complication rate and a 50% um, death rate. But the problem is on an individual base, which one of those ASA 4 patients will have that bad outcome? The ASA is not really helpful to telling us that. And to kind of um, illustrate that, let me walk you to an example here. So these are three patients, and these are actually taken from the you know, ASA um, uh, kind of tabulation of the ASA physical status. So our 50-year-old BMI 34 hypertension controlled um, for shoulder arthroplasty is an ASA 2. The next patient on end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis is an ASA 3. And the last patient who had a recent um, MI is an ASA 4. But if you now figure into the whole um, calculation that the ASA4 patient is going to get an excision of a skin lesion with local anesthesia under very mild sedation versus our first ASA2 patient will get a shoulder arthroplasty. It's kind of hard to tell the ASA2 patient that you're going to have a 0.1% death uh, chance versus tell the ASA4 patient that you have an 11.1% uh, chance of death during the surgery. So. Here, a very important factor is the procedure, and the procedure itself is not supposed to be taken into account uh, whenever you assess an ASA status. Okay, and with that, just a couple of take-home points. Um, again, as I mentioned, the ASA physical status classification was never intended to be used for individual risk prediction, and individual is the important uh, denominator here. It performs poorly when used for an individual patient. It does not take procedure and care team or facility related factors into account. And then the fact is that complex patients need to be condensed into a six point scale. And if you take away the brain dead donor, it's gonna be a five point scale. So getting the granularity of actually being able to predict a risk comes with more than just putting somebody into five points. And that's the reason why a lot of the other risk prediction scales have multiple variables that go into. And there are much better validated risk prediction systems out there. But that being said is all of those other better risk prediction systems have the big problem that they are more, much more cumbersome to use. The ASA physical status was, was designed to be very, very easy to apply and very straightforward. So you can assess this without any calculators, without any additional um, numbers whereas a lot of other risk prediction systems require you to gather additional data and input it into algorithms that give you a, a certain risk. And then lastly, the system remains useful for communication between anesthesia providers. And then again, it's used for billing, case assignment purposes, and administrative um, and other business related issues. And that would be all from my perspective. Thank you very much for your Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. That was indeed a very beautiful uh, summarize, well in time, about uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, scoring. Uh, any questions, uh, Dr. Mandela? Would you like to take over? Any questions, Dr. Manjula? Questions will be at the end, I thought. Okay. So uh, now my talk. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Uh, it's a proud privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Amarja Nagde. Dr. Amarja, uh, you can start sharing your screen. Dr. Amarja is going to yes, speak to us about risk scoring for non-cardiac surgery in a cardiac surgical patient. We all at IACTA are well aware of her as a blossoming 
cardiac anesthesiologist with a robust number of publications to her credit. She's working as an uh, associate editor as well as a consultant uh, cardiac anesthesiologist at Aurangabad at the Kalyani Bajaj Hospital. Uh, she's an awardee for many awards um, in various places and more than anything, she has spoken very voraciously on TEE as well as transthoracic echo. Today, she would be speaking on risk prediction scoring for non cardiac surgery. And something like this is very, very important because, uh, as Dr. Benjamin rightly pointed out, we have so many factors which give us a calibrative power. They tell us so much about the difference between the observer and the predicted risk. But nothing tells us how to overcome a bias when we may have a bias as a human being in predicting the risk when we triage the patients in an emergency or when we see them in an ICU. So over to Amarja for the cardiac patient and risk scoring in non-cardiac surgery. Uh, thank you, madam, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Indian College of Anesthesiology and uh, Dr. Murlidhar sir and the whole organizing team for having me here today. And uh, today, uh, let us discuss on the risk scoring for non-cardiac surgery in a cardiac patient. Vankatesh? Uh, what 17 and 12 is helpful? I'm not very sure. Uh, uh, so, uh, the major perioperative cardiac estimate to complicate between 1.4% to 3.9% of the uh, surgeries. The Most of this uh, they are selective. There is always opportunity to implement the strategies to reduce this risk. The incidence of the major adverse cardiac event of death or uh, myocardial infarction perioperatively is the first related to baseline risk. The timing of surgery after a recent myocardial event also impacts the rate of perioperative miss. The ACC AHA guidelines recommend at least a 60 day interval between an acute coronary syndrome and elective non cardiac surgery. So, what are the complications that this patient may have uh, while undergoing the non-cardiac surgery. The major complications are myocardial infarction, pulmonary edema, ventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest or complete heart block. Now there are this few factors which always have to be considered while assessing the cardiac risk. These are the patient related factors, the surgery related and the test related factors. The patient related factors are mainly age, the chronic disease if the patient has any like uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, functional status of the patient, medical therapy if he is on any uh, drugs, the implantable devices, previous surgeries and the surgery related factors like the type of surgery, the urgency of surgery and the duration of the operation. The test related factors are sensitivity and specificity of that particular test and the effect on management. There are also these factors affecting the cardiac risk. Apart from coronary artery disease, diabetes, as we all know, advanced age, hypertension, valvular diseases and arrhythmias or heart defects, uh, conduction defects, permanent pacemakers or ICDs, congestive heart failure, pulmonary art, uh, arterial diseases, congenital heart diseases, obesity and the type of surgery are also involved in uh, marking the cardiac risk of these patients coming for non-cardiac surgery. The cardiac risk also depends on the uh, risk that surgical procedure carries. Like there are few procedures which are uh, which fall into the high risk category, the intermediate and the uh, low risk categories. The high risk categories report almost more than 5% of the cardiac risk. And this involves the emergency major surgeries, particularly if they are in the older patients. Aortic and other major vascular surgeries, peripheral vascular surgeries and the long or prolonged surgeries because they have large fluid shifts and blood loss. Then the intermediate risk uh, patients because they carry this cardiac risk of less than 5%, the, hence they fall uh, in the intermediate category. These are like the carotid end arterectomies or the head and neck surgeries, intraperitoneal intrathoracic surgeries, orthopedic or prostate surgeries. 
Now the low risk are those surgeries in whom the cardiac risk is generally less than one percent. This may be like endoscopic surgeries or any superficial surgeries. So what is the original cardiac risk index and the revised cardiac in risk index? Now here we start the main topic of today. The Goldman index is the original cardiac risk index, which we uh, popularly, uh, which is called as Goldman index and we know it as Goldman index, which we will be discussing in some time. And uh, later on in 1999, Lee et al published uh, the cardiac risk index, which we now know, which is now known as revised cardiac risk index or the RCRI. Now coming to the Goldman multifactorial cardiac risk index. Um, this has uh, several risk factors and few points are allotted uh, to these risk factors and then we calculate the risk according to these points. Like the first and foremost to whom the maximum points have been allocated yeah. is the active heart failure. The preoperative third heart sound or the jugular venous distension indicating the active heart failure has been given 11 points. Then the myocardial infarction in the last six months. Then the premature ventricular ectopics before surgery, rhythm other than sinus, age more than 70 years, emergency surgery, significant aortic stenosis or intraperitoneal intrathoracic or aortic surgeries that is the major surgeries and the patient's general condition or the poor medical condition has been allocated few points and what they have done is if the patient has zero to five points, the risk that the patient carries is less than one percent. If the points are 6 to 25, the risk goes up to 9%. And if this uh, points are more than 26, the risk goes up to 22%. So that was about the Goldman multifactorial cardiac risk index. Now the next index, there were some limitations to the Goldman criteria and they were that um, it was not uh, very well matching with the vascular surgeries. The vascular surgeries, it did not match much. Therefore, Eagle et al. has come up with Eagle's cardiac risk index, which included other parameters which they found very useful while managing the vascular surgeries. Uh, next uh, uh, is the revised cardiac risk index. This is a very popular uh, risk index and is widely used all over the world. This has mainly six independent predictors and they are like the high risk surgery, the history of ischemic heart disease, history of congestive heart failure, history of cerebrovascular disease, preoperative treatment with insulin and preoperative serum creatinine more than 2 mg per dl. Now this RCRI predicts uh, this major cardiac events like myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, uh, ventricular fibrillation, heart blocks or cardiac arrest in adults undergoing major non-cardiac surgery. And each, each risk factor is assigned one point. The risk factor of major cardiac event is less than 1%. The risk is less than 1% if none or only one risk factor is present. It goes up to 6.6% .6 if two risk factors are present and it goes up to 11% if three or more risk factors are present. But RCRI also has some limitations that it poorly performs at predicting the post-operative mortality. It doesn't, it, 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 it only predicts this complications we have, which I have just mentioned. Uh, it does not uh, predict post-operative mortality. That is its main limitation. Also, it does not accurately predict an individual's absolute risk to cardiac complications as well because the increased sensitivity of contemporary biochemical tests for postoperative myocardial infarction is increased. So it does not uh, eventually accurately predict that risk as well. It has other limitations also like the component of the index such as diabetes mellitus may warrant elimination because they provide minimal prognostic information. Also, renal efficiency can be better defined using a GFR of that patient. Secondly, the surgical procedures would be better if they would be uh, uh, marked as the level of operative complexity. Finally, the index may need to incorporate several other prognostically important risk factors like increased age, peripheral arterial diseases and functional capacity.
it also has one more limitation and that is it is it underestimates the risk in major vascular surgeries and also few uh, low risk surgeries are not included in it therefore current guidelines recommend that either the rcri or the american college of surgeons surgical risk calculator or the mi cardiac risk uh, calculator derived from national surgical quality improvement that is nsqip database should be used now uh, the uh, i i want to emphasize on this one point is that as we all know pre operative levels of troponin and brain natriuretic peptide that is bnp are independent predictors of post operative cardiac complications the canadian cardiovascular society guidelines recommend measuring bnp levels in whom rcri score is greater than 1 or any other risk factors are present and also they ask for doing troponins if the bnp level is elevated for 2 to 3 days at least once daily so that is what canadian cardiovascular society guidelines uh, recommend so that was uh, about the rcri now coming to another score which is also a very important score which is called as national surgical quality improvement program nsqip score to overcome the limitations that rcri had this nsqip score was developed and validated in more than 2 lakh surgical patients this model include included age asa class functional status of the patient abnormal serum creatinine and a novel and more appropriate organ based categorization of the surgery this risk may be quantified by risk calculator on the internet the discriminative or the predictive ability of this Q, uh, nsqip score is significantly better as compared to rs uh, rcri and it also works well in the vascular surgical patients it also has few limitations although the prediction models were derived in very large multi center observational data set they have to undergo external validation especially in settings outside the united states also the routine post operative troponin surveillance was not implemented in all participating sites thereby leading to significant under reporting of post operative mi rates the acs nsqip uh, myocardial infarction uh, cardiac arrest outperformed the rcri in predicting myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest combined and all cause mortality so that was at, uh, about the pre operative indices we have a few more pre operative indices which we are going to see um, but uh, since i have come uh, across these two indices which are very important and uh, they have they are very important in um, in uh, scoring the risk pre operative risk of the patient coming for non cardiac surgery with the information about the intra operative and the post operative happenings these two scores are the portsmouth physiological and operative severity score for the enumeration of mortality and morbidity called as pposm and the surgical abgar score now what is this pposm score i have not gone into detail uh, but uh, this is really good and uh, this pposm score has 18 variables uh, and the Uh, what it mainly um, involves is the intraoperative characteristics like the extent of surgery the total blood loss and the peritoneal soiling but its limitation is it, it gives a complexity for bedside application and it may also um, tend to overestimate or underestimate the mortality and morbidity in some surgical populations um, this is about the intraoperative score uh, intraoperative uh, parameters that have considered in this course also the surgical abgar score this also considers the intraoperative and the post operative or um, parameters and it it has a 10 point risk index and mainly it involves the uh, operative characteristics of that patient that is the tachycardia hypotension and the estimated blood loss this score is validated across many uh, institutes and you know, countries this index facilitates early post operative identification for the patient who warrant more intensive monitoring so uh that was about this intra operative uh, two scores uh, which i have just mentioned now coming on again to the pre operative scores i i i have this two or three scores more um uh, like the uh, detsky modified score this is a model aimed at revealing the degree of cardiovascular risk in the pre operative setting in the patient uh, uh, patients who have relevant cardiac risk index they have nine items uh, which have the uh, predictive value for the risk and uh, these are mainly the age the myocardial infarction 
within six months or uh, less less than six months or more than six months. And um, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society angina, the unstable angina within six months, pulmonary edema, critical aortic stenosis, arrhythmias, emergency operations, and the general medical condition. And uh, they have given few points to it. And um, adding adding these points again will tell you the risk for this patient, the percentage of the risk this patients carry. So if the score total score is more than 30, the patient falls under high risk category. If the pay, if the score is between 16 to 30, it is the moderate risk. If the scores are less than 16, the patient has low risk. And the good part about the dead uh, ski modified score is that it has uh, taken emergency surgery into consideration. Also, the factors like angina and pulmonary edema into consideration. Yes, uh, now another score uh, is the Gupta preoperative risk for, uh, score for myocardial infarction cardiac arrest. Patient who underwent surgery were identified from the American College of Surgeons National uh, Surgical Quality Improvement Program database and more than 250 hospitals uh, were, um, uh, uh, were taken into consideration and uh, more than 2 lakh patients were uh, considered for this uh, particular risk scoring uh, and then more than 1000 developed perioperative myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest. Therefore, Gupta et al came to a conclusion that there are five predictors of perioperative myocardial infarction and cardiac arrest, and they identified them as the type of surgery, the dependent functional status, abnormal creatinine, the American Society of Anesthesiologists class and increasing age. So that was mostly about the uh, risk scoring uh, for the uh, perioperative uh, risk management of the patients. Uh, this is the American College of Cardiology cardiac risk classification, which has a few predictors. The uh, I have uh, I have just mentioned these slides, uh, not a uh, few points I have stated earlier, and these are the, the are the major predictors uh, and the intermediate and the uh, minor predictors. Then there is also John uh, modified John Hopkins surgical uh, criteria for again the perioperative risk assessment and uh, they have uh, just divided the risk assessment into mid, uh, minimal to moderate, moderate and severe. So these are the moderate risk criteria. These are the high risk criteria. And uh, that was all about from my side uh, for today uh, for the risk assessment uh, for the uh, uh, patients, uh, cardiac patients who come for non cardiac surgery. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. That was a very eloquent lecture. We we'll move on to the next case. Over to you, Dr. Benefit. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, now I call upon uh, Dr. Deepak Bode uh, to talk on uh, uh, the uh, risk scoring uh, for post-operative cardiac uh, surgery patients. Uh, the complications like renal dysfunction, uh, pulmonary dysfunction, and stroke, everything is very common, uh, not very common, but it is pretty common comparing to other surgeries in the cardiac population and uh, we want to know the court opinion from uh, Dr. Deepak Bode. Uh, sir is a consultant cardiac anesthetist from ozone anesthesia, and in ozone anesthesia group Aurangabad, Maharashtra and sir has many accolades uh, to his name and over to you sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Ganpati and Indian Col uh, College of Anesthesiologists and Dr. Kanchi Muridhar sir for having me to talk on this. Uh, risk course in uh, cardiac surgery and its application its applicability in indian patients so previous two speakers have uh, already spoken enough on why the scoring systems are important and how they change our practice so scoring systems are uh, pivotal in optimizing perioperative outcomes uh, from an anesthesiologist point of view when we do a pre anesthesia checkup we obviously want to identify high risk patients beforehand 
we want to allocate uh, most of our uh, resources to these patients who are high risk and we want to predict the risk and optimize the patients preoperatively as much as possible so this ultimately helps us in better patient counseling and to obtain informed consent and to have a better dialogue with the surgical team so uh, at times uh, if you have got a very prohibitively high risk in your center you may like to refer the patient to a higher center so this scoring systems obviously definitely help you in doing that uh, again it helps us to compare among hospitals or the cardiac surgical units in one hospital and it's sort of a positive stimulus for the cardiac surgical units to improve so all in all it helps us in the quality control so my talk will be basically revolving around these two most common scoring systems in contemporary cardiac surgical practice that is euroscore 2 and sts risk scores so euroscore was uh, introduced uh, in 1999 all of us know that it has served as a benchmark in cardiac surgery uh, there are more than 1400 citations uh, in medical literature about euroscore uh, then as the surgical uh, it, it, there was improvement in anesthesia surgery so ultimately log euroscore was introduced in 2006 and it was further improved in 2011 when euroscore 2 uh, has been available and this is basically to overcome the shortcomings of original score and keep up with the contemporary cardiac surgical practices the other risk score sts risk score in addition to providing major risk of mortality it also provides risk of post operative major morbidities as dr ganpati was mentioning that uh, we are definitely uh, encountering more uh, uh, post operative kidney injuries post operative pulmonary complications in cardiac surgical patients so sts score will help us in doing that so what does euroscore 2 tells us it tells us about the mortality which is like a death in same hospital as the operation took place or another hospital but before within 30 days but in addition sts risk score tells us about length of stay whether it is going to be less than 6 days that is short length of stay or more than 7 days that is long length of stay prolonged ventilation which is usually uh, 24 hours is the cut off limit renal failure which is Uh, either a dialysis or a doubling of creatinine stroke or a neurological deficit which can last for more than 72 hours probably the most devastating complication after cardiac surgery the deep sternal wound infections and reoperation probability so this was the uh, euroscore 2 classic paper by professor uh, sham nasif from uh, papworth hospital uh, it was published in 2012 exactly a decade ago but still holds uh, its charm uh, the euroscore 2 uh, was very very important uh, because there were many important points in it uh, there were more than 22 1000 uh, cardiac surgical patients which were studied from 43 countries and for the first time uh, four centers from india participated in data contribution for euroscore 2 they captured the data within one month of period divided them into two sets like developmental data set which was around 17000 patient and validation data set around 5000 patients so previously uh, uh, nyha classes 2 3 and 4 were involved they were categorized and only angina canadian uh, cardiology society 4 was incorporated diabetes mellitus was introduced first time which was not there in previous course a uh, previous course mentioned creatinine but now uh, in euroscore 2 creatinine clearance is mentioned because that is supposed to be a better predictor than absolute uh, serum creatinine value the new model recognizes various surgical categories like elective urgent emergency surgery or a salvage surgery and previously hepatic function was given emphasis in original euroscore which was not there so now if you see a, a typical a patients which we encounter a 65 year old male patient who is a chronic smoker has got a chronic lung disease who is a diabetic 
who has got a recent myocardial infarction enter all mi his ejection fraction is 40% uh, his nyh grade is 3 and he is posted for an elective or an isolated uh, cabg surgery so this risk calculator is available on internet uh, or it is available as an application in any smartphone and you have to this is the scroll down menu and you have to enter all the patient details and you directly get a risk of mortality so this particular patient has got a euro score that is probability of a mortality directly as 3.3 percent so in contrast this sts risk score uh, has got is specified for various surgical categories right from isolated cabbage surgery to isolated valve surgery to a combined surgery or a mitral valve repair surgery so just to give another example a 60 year old male who is having a degenerative aortic stenosis is posted for a surgical aortic valve replacement with no major comorbidities his risk of mortality is given fairly low and all these parameters like renal failure stroke are given uh, as for that particular patient so Euroscore 2 gives you only mortality. The STS score is more elaborate. STS score is basically derived from STS database and it is updated frequently. And there are lakhs and lakhs of patient data which is available. So that's why STS risk score can give you a detailed uh, mor morbidity risk as well. But Indian patients, uh, are they same as Westerners? This is the major question which all of us have always asked and do we follow the Western guidelines or the Western numbers or the Western uh, scores directly? Probably not exactly. So this was the initial paper which is uh, published in Annals of Cardiac Anesthesia from All India Institute, New Delhi. And they studied uh, 1000 consecutive adult patients undergoing CABG and valve surgery, mostly a rheumatic heart uh, disease patient and they studied original Euroscore and they found it that uh, it, it performed very well in low and moderate risk but it was it did not perform very well in the high risk surgical population. So coming to this paper which our group only published and we tried to uh, compare the Euroscore 2 and STS for risk score stratification in Indian patients. So we, our group actually studied 500 consecutive patients who had uh, who were posted for surgery. Majority of them were CABG. Some of them were valve surgeries. And the overall mortality was 1.6% only. To study any uh, risk uh, calculator, there are two major points. One is the calibration power. That is how overall the fit of the model is. And that is usually calculated by this osmer lemshow test. So uh, in our study, both Euroscore 2 and STS risk score had a satisfactory model fit. But when it came to discriminatory power, that is you want to really differentiate whether a low risk patient is not going to die or a high risk patient will have a high probability of mortality. So in that, both the scoring system were they did not perform very well. So if you see here, the area under ROC, if it is 0.7, then more than 0.7, I mean, or if this AU ROC is more towards left side and diagonally up, that means the area under ROC is higher. That means there is good discriminatory power. But in our study, the discriminatory power was poor. That was less than 0.7. So, um, Previously, our group included only uh, on-pump CABGs. So that's why we again performed the similar analysis in off-pump, exclusive off-pump CABGs. This time later uh, in the study, we included 1,200 patients. And uh, we found that Euroscore 2 particularly has got satisfactory calibration and discriminatory power. So major contributing factor in our cohort was conversion of this uh, off-pump CABG to on-pump CABG. And uh, the Euroscore not only helped in predicting the mortality, but it also helped in predicting conversion rate in off-pump CABG. That means higher the Euroscore 2, there is higher probability that patient may need to go on pump. 
So there is another paper uh, from uh, Nizam's Institute, Hyderabad, Dr. Gopinath sir and his team, and they also studied uh, mixed population uh, for Euroscore, CABG, and Val mixed Val surgery for over two years period time, and they also said that. Uh, the model fit was satisfactory and uh, uh, the discrimination also was good. So this was another paper from uh, New Delhi, Max Hospital actually, and they also came up with similar findings. But uh, I would like to catch your attention to this very recent paper actually published just a couple of months back from Kolkata. Uh, and they compared uh, Euroscore 2 and STS score in CABG patients. And again, if you see the Euroscore and STS had got this discriminatory power of only 0 0.712 or something like that. So it was just marginally it uh, did well. So it was not excellent correlation. It was just a moderately good correlation was there. And uh, they again, interesting thing which they did, they plotted a bland Altman uh, plot showing correlation between STS and Euroscore. And there was mean difference of 0.67 between these uh, two scoring systems. And there was little wide uh, correlation range between the two scoring systems. Uh, our neighbors, Bangladeshi population undergoing off -form CABG also did this analysis. And they said that as compared to the previous scores, that is log score and original Euroscore, uh, Euroscore 2 is definitely more recommended. Uh, this was an initial analysis published in, I think, 2014 uh, of 22 studies of more than uh, around 1,50,000 patients uh, from 22 different studies. And they also said that uh, despite heterogeneity in the population which was studied, there was good overall performance of Euroscore 2 in terms of discrimination and accuracy. So this uh, another recent uh, analysis, uh, the systematic uh, review and meta-analysis actually published last year. And uh, they said that Euroscore 2 calibration varied across the continents. So it performed fairly well in Europe and Asia, but not as good in South and North America. And they said that... Uh, STS score may have a broader application because as I said, STS score keeps on updating on a regular basis because they have got a huge data set with them. So they can keep on updating and modifying as frequently, almost a yearly as they can. So this STS score has got broader application and it is more recommended. But at the same time, STS risk score is a little cumbersome to calculate. You need to enter multiple variables to in order to get the exact numbers. So ultimately, how a risk score should be developed? So we need to state a clinical aim for the model. We, we need to prepare as many risk factors as possible and then select an appropriate modeling technique and select suitable patient population. Like most of, uh, like almost 70 to 80 percent of Indian cardiac surgical patients are off pump CAPG. And if your database does not have that much representation, so your obviously your scoring system is not going to perform well. So you need to select suitable uh, patient sample. You have to adopt a systematic strategy to handle missing data. And finally, you need to dis differentiate, like you need to have uh, estimation and validation uh, data sets to exactly get the numbers. So what are the conclusion of these various studies up till now, which I have said that Euroscore 2 definitely performs better than original or log Euroscore in terms of uh, calibration and discriminatory power. The original Euroscore actually over predicted in high risk patient that can be probably because the surgical techniques or overall perioperative techniques were not very well developed when the score was developed. So due, due to recent developments, uh, the risk, the overall uh, risk um, uh, handling in high risk patient has improved. So Euroscore 2 is acceptable uh, contemporary generic cardiac surgical model. Uh, both of these have got high uh, satisfactory calibration power, but they don't have exactly very good discriminatory power. So discriminatory power means you need to predict mortality in high risk patients and exactly in predicting very high risk patient population, these models don't do very well. The reason can be because there is very less representation of Indian 
cardiac surgical patient in both of these scoring systems. So prediction of morbidity with STS is not validated in many of the parameters. There are not many studies available. So there is a definite scope for improvement in applying these scores to Indian population undergoing cardiac surgery. And the most important step uh, for this is forming a national database, just like STS database, and utilizing this information in formulating and continuously upgrading this risk scores for better quality care to cardiac surgical patients in India. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, for that excellent presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Please stay back because we, uh, you, if there's a question directed to you, you might have to take it up at the end of the session. Surely, sir. Thank you. Please stay back. Now we have to switch gears and we have to enter the intensive care unit. And uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Pooja Murthy as an intensivist. Dr. Pooja Murthy, can you come on the screen, please? She works for the Manipal Hospital in Bangalore. She is very, uh, um, very much valued uh, intensivist with a lot of academic accolades. May I request Pooja Murthy to tell us about the risk scoring system that's, uh, that uh, system that are available in intensive care unit, and uh, what is the take home message for? as regarding risk scoring in intensive care units. Dr. Pooja Murthy, please. Kindly unmute your mic. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I lost the connection. I'm just coming in. Give me a minute. Uh, is it visible, sir? Hello? Uh, yes, madam. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, we can see. Uh, there is a connection lag. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murlidhar and uh, the entire organizing team for having me here. Uh, the topic which we are going to deal today is going to be a predictive risk scoring system in the intensive care. Uh, let us uh, deal with the following topics today. One will be the introduction part and also let us see how it has developed uh, the scoring system, especially in perspective of intensive care unit. Uh, we will also discuss the most commonly used ones, the scoring systems like Apache and also try to conclude it. We all know that death is certain, like uh, Lord Krishna in the Gita has told us that death is as sure as a person is born. So death is certain but can we predict it that's the big question mortality prediction is not new it has been attempted uh, ages across hippocrates also has attempted to predict mortality uh, in the age old days but uh, why is it so important because death is a daily affair in intensive care unit but of course with advances in therapies and improvement in uh, significant uh, uh, improvement in significant treatment modalities, mortality has definitely improved. But how do we do it? Definitely subjective is the most common one. A physician is a great predictor of a mortality. We get to know when we see a patient that uh, if he's going to kind of survive, not survive. Objectively, definitely using scoring systems. Uh, what is a scoring system? A scoring system definitely comprises of various physiological and laboratory data. It gives us a number, a score, and this, when it is put into a computer-based algorithm or an equation, will generally help us to predict outcomes. Uh, why do we need a scoring system? Generally, most often, we also want to know how it is going to be. For example, if my patient it's eight is admitted in the hospital, I want to know if 
how is the outcome going to be so i want to know what is the mortality the other outcomes like how long it is going to be in the icu for the physician it is definitely going to be about clinical decision making so even though patient may look very stable but if they have a high risk severity score the overall outcome may not be great and uh, of course uh, in benchmarking for example comparing various uh, icus across uh the country across the states in fact uh, even the uh, insurance companies the medical legal system in the us uh, are taking into account the scoring systems how were the scoring systems developed so it all started in the 80s and now we had apache saps moving on to the sofa score which is very important for us in sepsis and also right now we have the recent ones that is uh, 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 the apache 4 which is the recent one and also uh, saps 3 how are the scoring systems classified they can be classified as first stage scoring systems or repetitive scoring systems the first stage scoring systems are mainly the apache saps and the mortality prediction models the repetitive scoring systems the most common one is the sofa that is sequential organ failure assessments but before we jump to what these scoring systems are let us understand something about scoring system i think dr deepak also told us what the scoring system is in perspective of cardiac surgery but for now it generally comprises of a score and also has a probability of outcome that is mortality so how was it developed so where is uh methods Mo most important is a large number of, of people from across several icus are pulled in for the data and a data collection happens after that a score is calculated then the most important thing is validation and customization so it has to be validated and customized to the population interest of interest and has to be periodically calibrated so that it is up to date to the treatments and newer changes that happen coming to data collection uh two things are important here what are the variables measured and when they are measured so uh, apache uses a lot of physiological and general health data there are various scoring systems like sofa which uses concise data uh in terms of timelines most of them the generalized scoring systems do it in the first 24 hours of icu admission and uh, there are other uh, repetitive scoring systems like sofa which do it periodically like every 48 hours these are either put into a computer generated algorithm or an equation to give us a predictor or a mortality prediction what are we interested all of us are interested to know the mortality but can we do better definitely some of the newer scoring systems can predict the length of icu stay there are other various scoring systems that help us in resource utilization the frequency of laboratory tests and uh, the number of days on mechanical ventilation so all these things definitely are being uh, predicted but whenever we talk about a scoring system we have to understand two important terminologies one is discrimination and the other is calibration what is discrimination discrimination means how accurately a given score predicts outcome for example say uh, a scoring system has predicted a mortality of 60% so is it actually 60% is it less or more that is what discrimination says and it is most often uh, given by a a, a, a score of uh, area uh, auroc that is area under the receiver operator curve it is more than 0.7 or if it is very good if it is more than 0.8 and 0.9 shows very good discrimination calibration is how the scoring systems performs across a wide range of predicted mortalities it is definitely very sensitive to the case mix and the patient interventions that happen so it has to be it has to have a very good calibration we all follow idealism idealism is one thing which we all aim at but what is the ideal scoring system it's the variables which we use should be extremely easy to measure it shouldn't be cumbersome it should have a extremely high level of discrimination so that it predicts accurately it should be well calibrated it should be validated across the patients whom we are interested in for example if we are going to measure it in our country in our institute 
we should make sure that it is validated in that uh, cohort of patients and also it should not only predict mortality but also should predict other parameters like icu length of stay what will be the quality of life how much will be the duration of mechanical ventilation and other things so now uh, let us try to understand what is available to us of course idealism is difficult to achieve but let us see what is available to us apache is the most common one we also have saps and mortality prediction models which are also being used let us dwell a little bit more upon the apache score that is acute physiology and chronic health evaluation score it was the the original one was developed in 1981 in the united states it mainly comprised of two parameters one is the acute physiology score and the other one was the chronic health evaluation the acute physiology uh, in this part which we have to understand is was the worst value was taken in the first 32 hours of uh, icu admission this is unlike the recent ones which measure it in the first 24 hours and chronic health evaluation perspective was graded from a to d and it was really vague uh, only d indicated severe failing health and indicate uh, was an independent risk factor for mortality but rest of the abc criteria did not predict much it was definitely uh, done around 5000 patients then later on after 4 years in 1985 there was improvisation of the apache score because of its flaws uh, and the apache 2 came into the picture so it had mainly three parameters one is the acute physiology score which had 12 physiological parameters and here we can see a major change that in the first 24 hours uh, was the worst value taken age and also chronic health evaluation played a major role here unlike the vagity which was there in apache the original one the score ranged between 0 to uh, 71 and uh, of course uh, the risks of mortality are extremely high if it crosses 30 and 35 and uh, uh, what were the changes i think the more a, a lot of weightage was given for glasgow coma scale creatinine and acute kidney injury was given a lot of weightage and also there were certain changes in measurements of oxygenation parameters definitely there is one thing uh, as per uh, anesthesia panel should uh, kind of it may be important uh, is one is emergency post operative patient had a higher scoring when compared to elective post operative patients so uh, this is one thing which was different in apache 2 compared to the original apache score and again the score was given by calculation of all the three parameters and uh, we get a score so this is how the apache looks like it looks a little complex but uh, this is the most simplest one of the recent apaches these are the physiological parameters chronic health points age points and we get a score uh, as we can see a score more than 34 indicates a mortality of 85% whereas a score of less than 15 is uh, predicts a mortality of less than 15% then subsequently came apache 3 1991 it was studied in a wider population of around 17000 patients and it involved uh, 42 icus uh, in united states uh, it again uh, has measured various parameters there are certain changes that it has a parameter for acid base evaluation gcs score is again based uh, on a little changed algorithm and has a larger score spectrum 0 to 299 uh two versions of apache 3 are there one is the version h and version i and uh, the most important salient feature of apache 3 which is better when compared to apache 2 is it considers icu readmission the location prior to icu admission the hospital length of stay and location prior to icu admission also into the factors uh, in predicting outcomes so this prevents something called as lead time bias which is seen with apache 2 scoring system so this is one of the most important uh, step ups which we can see in apache 3 and definitely it predicts most of these outcomes which we anticipate subsequently the most recent apache was developed in 2006 it was studied across a extremely wide range of population of more than 1 1.3 lakhs and across 104 icus in the united states uh it also has almost similar factors compared to apache 2 and 3 but the categories or variables are extremely high which is about 116 
definitely apache system looks complex but uh, it is the most commonly used one and apache 2 because of its wide applicability and availability is still the most common one in fact in our institution we still follow the apache 2 system apache 4 is more robust more complex has extremely good discrimination and calibration values and also predicts icu length of stay in a very great way but definitely 3 and 4 are not widely applicable mostly because it is not easily available and has property issues and also is definitely costly. So the other models which we know of are simplified acute physiological scores, uh, which again, the major advantage of this is it is extremely generalizable and has good external validation because it was validated in 35 countries. The, this is how the SAP scoring system looks like. And also the mortality prediction model, it has again three models. It was mainly studied in Europe and uh, USA. And uh, the major disadvantage of uh, MPN system is that it doesn't involve the subsets of cardiac surgery, patients who have myocardial inf infarction and also has lead time bias because it does not consider ICU readmissions. So this is also one of the uh, mortality scoring system that has been used. This is what it looks like. The first one is the MPM0 and the second one are the two newer versions that is uh, MPM48 and 72 hours. We all know that uh, SOFA, what, what is this? So we are not talking about the SOFA at home, but we are talking about the SOFA scoring system. And uh, somebody in our institute was likely joking that sepsis sits on SOFA. So that's one thing, one lighter way to remember that uh, SOFA scoring system is used, of, used for sepsis. It was definitely uh, originally developed in uh, 1994 for use in sepsis, but later it was, uh, the applicability was uh, extended to prediction of mortality. It is a repetitive scoring system and uh, is concise uh, and has uh, mainly involves six organ systems. So the most important thing about SOFA scoring system is its predictability and applicability with changing time in the ICU. For example, if a patient presents to uh, presents and has a SOFA score which was normal or less, but if there is an increase after 48 hours, the mortality is more than 50% for such patients. Or even if there is no change or decreased change but has presented with a high SOFA score of more than eight, the mortality is still high. And another point which we have to note is in patients with septic shock, a score of more than two definitely has higher mortality. It's around 40%. Unlike a patient who is not in shock, the mortality is just around 10%. So definitely so far is a repetitive scoring system. But one thing which is uh, which we have to understand is so far does not take the chronic health status into account. So a patient with malignancy, a patient with multi-organ failure, uh, have definitely according to other scores like Apache a poorer outcome, but this is not taken into account uh, in the SOFA score. This is what a SOFA scoring system looks like. There are various other specific predictive scoring systems and also there are various scoring systems for trauma, which I think we'll not discuss here. But the main important question remains, which one to use when we have a lot of things, a lot of scores and many upcoming things uh, on our platter, which is the best one. The most commonly used are the Apache, SOFA, SAPS and the mortality prediction model. These are the generalized scoring systems and uh, SOFA is one of the repetitive scoring systems that are used. But which one do we choose? Definitely the most recent and validated uh, scoring system, which is of our in our population of interest has to be selected. It has also should be user friendly. It should be easily accessible should have less cost implications and should predict the outcomes, not only mortality, but other things like length of stay, resource utilization, et cetera. So which one fits, which is better? Uh, is one better than the other? Definitely the generalized scoring systems have shown to be superior than uh, the rest of the scoring systems. Among the older models, Apache 2 and 3 perform better. When compared to the newer models, that is Apache 4, SAPS 3, and MP3, uh, mortality prediction model of 3, uh, the newer models perform better than older models. And also, the newer models have a very good calibration and discrimination characteristics. Some of them have 
discrimination uh, ROC between 0.8 to 0.9, which is extremely good. But one thing we need to note here that no single model is significant or significantly superior to the other in terms of predicting mortality. So we have to use it tailor-made, not generalized. Coming to limitations, definitely all these scoring systems need to be uh, validated externally, that they should undergo external val validation in the population which we are interested in. Some of the scoring systems omit pregnancy, special groups like pregnancy, children, in predicting outcomes. They all need periodic recalibration. Uh, otherwise, they may over predict mortality eventually. Lead time bias, as we discussed earlier, is seen mainly with Apache 2 and some of the models of SAPS. And Apache 3 and 4, even though they're extremely robust and have good discrimination calibration characteristics, but are extremely complicated. At the end, some studies have shown that compared to clinical judgment alone and compared to scoring system alone, none of them is better. So we have to combine clinical judgment and the scoring system together to predict a mortality. But is it the end of the whole thing? No, there is something more in the future. As this is the era of artificial intelligence, we all have Alexas and Google Homes in our houses. It is the system of uh, uh, assembling the artificial intelligence system into our critical care lives as well. There is something known as a super learner ensemble. This is a recent paper which was published in the COVID era. Uh, this has around 14 statistical learning models, which uses the computer-based data to predict the mortality. This is mainly used in this study. It has been used uh, in COVID-19 patients. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is the future. Uh, one of the other uh, predictive models, it is mainly based on something called as the MIMIC-3 database of the US, which is supposed to be the largest database mm. of intensive care patients in the uh, United States. So this has used that database to derive this scoring system. It is a hybrid neural network approach and it is a artificial intelligence mortality score. So this system has uh, studied it across uh, three groups. One is at day three, at day seven, and at day 14. And all of them have shown to have extremely superior uh, discriminatory powers as high as 0.8 and 0.9. And among them, the mortality prediction at day three was far more superior. So it is not, uh, it will not be a, a dream or a distant vision that uh, we enter the ICU and we get a mortality prediction of our patient soon. So let's look forward to that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pooja, for a very excellent elaborated talk on how to score, risk score your patients in the ICU. I just, while you were talking on your last slide about COVID-19, I just wanted to ask you a question on something uh, which has come up in very recent times in the Canadian Journal probably, is the development of a repeated measure predictive model uh, risk score for mortality in ventilated COVID-19 patients. Now these authors have uh, combined uh, the Apache 2 score that you talked about and they have taken into consideration the laboratory, the clinical, as well as the uh, demographic profile of about only 177 patients. And they have said that if you model them together and see certain parameters which are laboratory, <coughs> certain which is dependent on the ethnicity of the Americans coming from different parts of the country, but who are mechanical ventilation, it has been done in seven different centers and also seeing the clinical parameters like lactate, lactate clearance, a lot of hemodynamic parameters. They have a list of those parameters. And it is chiefly done on ventilated patients. And they have very beautifully concluded the results that uh, this predictive model of uh, clinical risk scoring for mortality bears very good results if you join or combine laboratory with clinical markers, with ventilatory markers, with demographic profiles. Now, something like this we were not seeing earlier. Most of right from, uh, as uh, Amarja pointed out, the Lee Atkins book telling us the Goldman scoring index and then it getting revised to RCRI, which we all use 
uh, seeing that most of our patients in cardiac surgery are patients of high risk diabetes or ischemic heart disease or conge congestive heart failure. But we don't keep the demographic profile into view. If I see and learn from Dr. Benjamin as well as Deepak's lecture, I did learn a very important factor. And uh, that factor is chiefly that when you predict and you do something known as calibration, then the discriminatory power is very, very important. And this is what brings about the bias that I was talking about when you triage your patients in the emergency. So which patient should go to the CCU, which to the ICU, we do not know. So probably keeping a demographic profile is important and probably COVID-19 very recent paper, as, as recent as December 2021 from Canadian Journal points this out. And I thought I would just like to include this profile, which is important. Excellent presentations. Uh, Dr. Mulidhar, you can take over. Uh, uh, lovely presentations, all the four, these four speakers have done extremely well. Dr. Benjamin, Amarja, Deepak and Pooja, thank you so much. Now I think we will uh, go into the chat box and also mix up some panel questions. So first question is to Dr. Nagare, Amarja, yeah. regarding RCRI, history of ischemic heart disease means what? What are the questions you would ask during the risk assessment? Somebody wants to know? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, disease. Yes, uh, this is a question by uh, Dr. Srirang Kulkarni, and I would like to answer him. Uh, if you take into account uh, ischemic heart disease, heart disease pathophysiology, it is the imbalance between the uh, myocardial oxygen supply and demand. And that tells us what we have to ask in uh, ask uh, to this patient uh, for asking or for getting the risk what he has. Like we ask for all the symptoms of ischemic heart disease, like sweating, chest pain, or chest discomfort. More so on exertion, if the patient has dyspnea on exertion, and ask particularly for the history of diabetes, hypertension, and smoking, because they are particularly at higher risk. Also, you can ask for history of coronary artery disease in family. Ask the patient if he is on any drugs like nitrates or statins. And in RCRI, we mainly ask uh, this IHD history because it makes us uh, cautious that there is some atherosclerotic phenomena in the coronaries of this patient, which can culminate into acute coronary syndrome perioperatively. So that is the main reason why we ask history of IHD. Thank you, Amarja, for that response. Uh, I will ask one question to the panelists, uh, Dr. Poonam Malhotra. What is the risk scoring you use in your practice to use different risk scoring for different categories of patients? Yes, sir. Um, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, I generally, in our center, we use the ASA, which is the uh, manner in which we do the PAC of our patients, seeing the, the ASA along with the NYHA. That is the broad scoring in the pre-operative time period. But something that uh, we do to categorize them as emergency or semi-emergency or elective or sick or very sick patients is to do the functional class. Something that was not mentioned, that means we make the patient walk for up to 10 meters, um, 10 meters or 4 meters. The patient can walk between 4 to 10. He's a moderate risk uh, with other things like, especially because most of these patients have a low threshold of ischemia in their uh, systems. They're all coming for cardiac surgery. Keeping that in mind, the functional status and the functional capacity of the patient of how much to walk a flight of step and how to get the dyspnea at rest or an exertion after a 10 meds or a, just up to four or less than four meds is what is the Duke's classification of the functional capacity. And that is something that we practice quite a bit in our system in the pre-op period. And that's how we categorize our patients, not just on ASA and NYHA. The third thing that we do for most of our patients who are coming for uh, elective surgeries is the RCRI. We, we mm -hmm. do the device that, uh, index in a very big way because most patients are diabetic. Most patients, as Dr. Ganpati also pointed out, have an AKI and we do suspect that with a low ejection fraction, these patients will have a 
immediate post surgery aki impending so it's not one uh, functional class that you do in the icu you use the sofa scores very rampantly the all the three sofa scores we were using but generally we tend to use apache 3 with sofa 3 that is what we are using a very favorite of all of us is the lactate clearance with the po2 and the base excess we've done a lot of studies on prognostic markers in top in our center with at least 18 markers being thought of and to our mind the base excess is one of the best markers so a plus minus 5 base excess is a very good indicator which is also a part of the sofa score one of the parameters that along with lactic clearance po2 and uh, spo2 go a long way with the hemodynamic parameters so we don't have just one different patients yes you categorize them differently whether they are in the icu or the pre op or intra op most of us do still follow the euro scores a simply 6 minutes walk test is also quite popular nowadays and people are using that test as a simplest test which we can do it anywhere very right very right yeah, yeah. functional so may I request all the panelists and the speakers to have the videos on uh deepak gode there is one comment about use of inotropes and iabp in the pre operative surgical patients yes actually uh, actually sir U- euroscore 2 uh, euroscore 2 has very clearly mentioned critical uh, pre operative status so in critical pre operative status all these parameters have included like somebody who has received a cpr in recent past or somebody yes. with a balloon yes. pump or somebody who is on inotropes for more than 24 hours so those are all are categorized as critical and accordingly the log value increases exponentially so the patient automatically goes in a very high risk state if he has got a pre operative balloon pump or pre operative inotropes or he has received a cpr Very right. Uh, Dr. Closel, uh, a 25-year-old with BMI of 52, AAC3, no comorbidities, posted for laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, should be explained the chance of dying during surgery is 1.4 percent. We have replied to it, but the, for the benefit of other uh, people, if you can uh, explain it, please. Kindly unmute your mic. Sorry, thank you. Um, so that was that was a very good question, and um, that was what I was alluding to the the level of granularity that the ASAPS affords us. So um, that patient, and I was giving an example. I was uh, putting the same information into the ACS and NSQIP database, and that database gave us a risk of death of 0.3 percent. So much, much lower than the 1.4 percent. So two things. One is um, again the ASAPS doesn't take into account the procedure. So what might happen is if you look at large aggregate outcome data, uh, is that you have a pool of ASA3 patients. Some of them go for extreme. extremely extremely challenging surgeries and have bad outcomes and you have a pool of them that go for minimal surgeries and have very good outcomes so we need an extra kind of an extra discriminator to know where our patients falls into that large range and that discriminator is typically not given in the ASAPS and the ASA has a couple of um of kind of like um funny uh things that makes it harder to apply to give you an example so i say that when you assign an asa score to a patient you're not supposed to take into account what procedure they have but let's say i have that healthy 20 year old that has a motor vehicle accident and is now herniating and needs to go for neurosurgery so am i going to make this patient an asa 1 no that patient is an asa 5 because that patient is essentially dying so now for asa 5 designations we need to take the procedure to a certain degree into account which makes it really hard and then the same is um we know for the asa that there's a very large interrater variability and that's something that the american association um uh, the american society of anesthesiologists has been trying to ass- address and there are a lot of studies looking into you know providing examples or what can we do to reduce that interrater uh, variability because there's always a component of 
um, experience of the anesthesiologist who is with, who assigns that score. So let's say if you have a patient who comes to you with bad coronary artery disease, a cardiac anesthesiologist who is experienced and, and comfortable managing this patient might actually assign a lower ASA score than a person who you know just doesn't do those cases. Um, and from that perspective, because of the large variability, it's it's really hard to assign an ASA score, look at the mortality rate, and tell your patient that's your mortality rate. So um, for us, between us communicating, this is a very good score because it's easy to implement, but everything beyond that, it's, it's much harder. And it was mentioned artificial intelligence. You know, it would be, I think, in the, in the critical care unit is probably a little bit ahead of us in that regard because at places where I worked, we had... AI systems that basically calculated SOFA scores or other scores, critical care related scores. And, um, you know, our dream is for anesthesia. Is that possible too? If I have a preoperative evaluation, is there some kind of computer based way of assisting me with um, putting a number or a risk prediction number to that? And that would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for that response. We'll use the Euroscore app on the mobile phone for cardiac surgical patients preoperatively, and uh, that works out reasonably well. Thank you for your response. I would like to ask Dr. Ganapati, uh, do you use organ-specific risk scoring for any given patient, or do you use the general uh, 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 generic type of risk scoring uh, in your setup, and what is your opinion on this? Uh, we generally follow Euroscore only, sir. We don't follow any organ specific uh, scoring uh, in our day to day practice. Obviously, we will take opinion from the specialist uh, when it comes to that organ specific issues are there. Uh, but uh, we follow Euroscore only, mainly Euroscore. Uh, according to that, a calculator. Uh, we follow that and uh, we made it even mandatory for our uh, DMB students uh, and uh, people to calculate and write it on the paper. Uh, what is the Euroscope for that particular yes. patient? And uh, as uh, Dr. Deepak Bode said, uh, uh, we find it like uh, low risk and intermediate risk, it predicts pretty well, but high risk patients, it underestimates yes. the mortality. That, that is the yes. general feeling. So we obviously, when I explain about that particular patient, that particular uh, procedure, uh, we explain definitely more mortality or morbidity uh, to the patient. Uh, so that is uh, one practical point I want to insist. Exactly, sir. And the high risk category is the one where we are actually interested the most. And unfortunately, the scoring systems don't work the best in that category. So that probably we need to improve them for better fit in our population. I, I just want to add something here. There are many overlapping gray zones in this, Deepak. Wherever we feel in high risk category, let's say we have a patient on ECMO. This is a dilemma on an everyday use. You have a value of 40. Now, would you want to cut up your heparin? Would you want to lower down your heparin uh, to make it between 50 to 60? And the moment it steps up 60, how much of heparin to give? Now, these are values which are numbers, right? But this also requires expertise, as Dr. Benjamin was saying. Sometimes the expertise of two or three consultants will overlook the numbers. Sometimes the numbers will become more important to the younger group who is managing the ECMO in that particular shift. So uh, I think there is a lot of positive advice of the clinician depending on their expertise. One may rely on numbers, one may rely on uh, their experience in the past and what happens if you allow the APTT to be 64, it's as good as being an APTT of 48. Some third person may come in and say, oh, my trending is better. So I think it's a mix and match with a lot of gray zones and you can't assign numbers. And then anesthesia practice, whether you're in an ICU or in the periop table. Sometimes it's experience, I think, that wins. Uh, Dr. Kumar, you want to say something? Yeah, yes, sir. Very good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for all the speakers. Uh, all four have uh, done an excellent job. Uh, after hearing so much about risk scoring, I am uh, totally confused. What to use <laughs> needs setting, I am totally confused. That is my real, <laughs> real statement. Uh, so I wanted to ask the common question to all four. What is the ideal validator risk scoring with evidence? 
for each setting. Like uh, I can go to the first uh, speaker, Dr. Benjamin. I, he, has, he was talking about uh, ASA. In that, uh, he was clearly telling that it does not involve the pro procedure or facility in that uh, particular scoring. Correct. So, what is a uh, better validated risk uh, uh, assessment system for that uh, all anesthesia patients? That is what you mentioned. Can you please uh, tell what? what the, I don't want that explanation. All those just a single score will follow. No, no, no issues. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, patients Possible. coming for so, cardiac surgery or for non-cardiac surgery that should be taken into consideration. Yeah, 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 yeah. understood. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, you know, um, the, the ACS in script database uh, risk calculator, I think for, for a lot of uh, surgeries, because it's such a large database and uh, a lot of variables into is good. The um, PPOSM, the, the, P -possum, the uh, Portsmouth um, risk enumeration is also a pretty, it's a very good uh, risk indicator. And then, you know, going more into the cardiac realm, I, I leave that to the other speakers, but I think like SPS database, yours, there, but again, it, it has to also be at which, which patient population you're looking at, but that would be the other part. Okay, thank you. Uh, about uh, the, the risk scoring in non cardiac surgery by Dr. Amarja, it was a good talk and uh, uh, she was telling about RCRI and Gupta, so much scoring system, but finally she didn't conclude that uh, what scoring system is currently in use or validated for better usage in uh, patient coming for non-cardiac surgery. So I wanted your explanation and at least uh, tell something to, uh, to the audience. This, this scoring is scoring system, yes. Yeah. yes, sir. Uh, there are many, many uh, scoring systems which we have seen uh, and uh, previously the Goldman and all these were used, but now widely used is the RCRI. And uh, because if you take into account uh, uh, this major non-cardiac surgery patients who are at risk for this cardiac events, the six components which RCRI includes uh, like the IHD or the heart failure or uh, cerebrovascular diseases and uh, serum creat level, uh, all these are all these patients into our clinical practice also we see are very highly prone for this risk uh, mace or uh, all the components of mace uh, which I have mentioned earlier. So I think the widely used and what we also usually see is the RCRI only. Yeah, RCRI plus dropout in BNP or only RCRI? <laughs> what emergency <laughs> surgeries? Couldn't get RCRI with the troponin in BNP or only RCRI? Uh, yes, we take into account troponin in cardiac surgery. We take into account the BNP and the troponins as well. Okay, can I say a simple solution? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm a simple turn. I am a simple turn. So I use ACA for general anesthesia purposes. Okay, sir. Euroscore for cardiac surgery, RCRI for cardiac patient coming for non-cardiac surgery, and so far for critical care units. Simple. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Sir. I'm like, coming to that th third topic with the Dr. Deepa Kode. It was an excellent yeah. talk, and he is clearly telling that Euro score and HTA score in Indian population has uh, discriminatory yeah. power of very poor discriminatory power. In so, in that situation, theory. if nothing is uh, doing well with Indian population, which is the ideal scoring system for Indian cardiac surgery patients? Uh, actually, Euroscore 2, I will say, because you have got it very readily available. You have got a mobile app available for it. So just as uh, you do pre-operative checkup, you can feed all the data and you get a number and you get a reasonable number. That number, as Poonam Madam said, that it may not be true for that particular situation. It's a general term. So if it's like a high risk patient, probably you would like to allot uh, it to a senior consultant. At least you can do that much part. So you can at least do whatever resources you have. You would like to give best of resources to the highest risk surgery on your list on that day. I think Anji Murlidhar sir also will agree to it. Yeah, no, I, I agree would, with you, but, was, but, but I think I would have develop. said you will come out with an Indian score. <laughs> we have to develop our own score. Yes, absolutely. That's what I heard. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we should that come out with that. We should absolutely. come out with that with all of us helping him. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Upset is different yeah. because uh, coronary artery disease is occurring much earlier in Asian population, has an aggressive course, and diabetes is very prevalent here. So many things are different as compared to Western population. Yes. Yeah. And coming to the last one uh, about yes, 
IC scoring system in ICO, uh, uh, it was an excellent talk by Dr. Puja. It was uh, really uh, very clear talk. Uh, my uh, so the single question is: What is that better scoring system, particularly in post-operative ICU settings? Uh, definitely, I would like to answer it in two parts. One yeah, is yes. what we want to use in our uh, resource-limited country uh, in most of the settings. Of course, uh, not really. So I think Apache too, uh, like uh, I think everybody is mentioning about uh, mobile apps. We definitely have uh, it extremely easily available in terms of calculators. Even in medical and all, we get the Apache too. In our unit, what we have done is we have integrated into our uh, digital system that's called the track chair, where our registrars just feed it with each patient. And we get a scoring system. So we do it uh, most often in first 24 hours value, we uh, do it and we get a particular score for each patient so that we get to know how it is. It also helps us in research in a lot of times. So far, uh, definitely it's very easy to use and uh, we would definitely recommend so far maybe because uh, ICU every day changes and repetitive scoring systems are better that way. But of course it has its flaws and drawbacks. But if you ask me, if you give me the ideal situation, I would choose Apache 4 because it is having an excellent calibration and discrimination power right now. Third point is, if you ask me the future, I would definitely say artificial intelligence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pooja, for that. Uh, yeah. There are three more questions. We will quickly go through that because we need to finish and have a dinner in right time. So the next question is about the role of echo in predicting outcome. Uh, does ejection fraction or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion has a role in risk stratification of these patients? Any of the panelists or two speakers can answer this. What is the role of ECHO in predicting outcome and risk stratification? Anyone from the panelists? Uh, ejection fraction, ejection fraction yes, comes, yes. Uh, comes in that uh, Euroscore itself in that critical uh, preoperative things. Uh, the ejection fraction of uh, above 50 percent and 30 to 50 percent yes. and less than 30 percent. So definitely that uh, is very important. Uh, I don't think TAPSA is involved, uh, included in Euroscore or anything. No, no, but no. Uh, the TAPSA RV dysfunction is a very very RV dysfunction is always uh, treated uh, with very very too much caution preoperatively. It's always very difficult to manage RV dysfunction than LV dysfunction. That's what we uh, cardiac anesthetists feel. So oh. if that say is very low, then we have to put very high risk for the patient. I think uh, that's so. a practical point, but in Euroscore, uh, ejection fraction is the answer. Totally right. Yeah. How reliable is MACE? Somebody wants to know how reliable is MACE. I, I, I don't know that if there's a complete question. Uh, Amarja, do you want to take it up? How reliable is the MACE? Uh, I think it's an incomplete question. There should yes, be something following that. Adverse cardiac events. Actually, major adverse cardiac event, and that is the outcome of uh, uh, any surgery or the uh, complications that occur, which may be in the form of complete heart block or say cardiac failure or uh, like uh, arrhythmias or myocardial infarction. Uh, so that is not any uh, factor on which it is judged, but it is the outcome of that risk factor. Right, right. The last question probably, why is ASA PES still the most widely used system? Maybe Benjamin may like to take it up. Is, is it the most widely used system and why is it so? It is, it is very widely used, but uh, it, to answer this, it took a life of its own, ran with it, and now it's so deeply integrated that we can't get it out <laughs> to say <laughs> no. So it, again, it still has its value. The problem was it was, again, never intended to be really risk prediction, but um, People took it up. So think about, you know, if you ask a surgeon or the gastroenterologist, they assign ASA scores when they do their, you know, like a monitored sedation or so. Right. And uh, billing companies took it up. So it's something that it, it's hard to remove, but it's, I think for us as an anesthesia um, uh, group, it would be good to kind of pivot more to other systems for risk prediction and leave the ASA as the tabular statistical um, grouping of patient and potentially looking at outcome for large aggregate data. Yes, yes. There are two other questions. Shall we go through it quickly? 
uh, one is non cardiac surgery patient with low ef what is the risk prediction for af non cardiac surgery with low ef what is the pr risk prediction for af i think atrial fibrillation is what is the, uh, what is the risk of atrial fibrillation in patients who have low ef i think that's what is the question so patients with low ef will be prone to af somewhere or the other and uh, one should be one can just have a 30 to 40% prediction just as a arbitrary number because in your mind mentally a low ef complications will come up one of them would be perioperative ischemia uh, of any kind sudden onset and the other will be the development of a sudden af on the ot table so you will be 30 to 40% ready for a af to happen yeah and yeah. the 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 same question i think in talks of the chatsweck score which again is a very strong predictor for particularly when your patient comes on these no acts Uh, any kind of a oral anticoagulant that the patient is coming for before a cardiac surgery whether it has been done away with whether it is carried on when to restart it after surgery th this is a chadwick score is again a score for af as well as especially for those who are on oral anticoagulants where you are going to be very suspicious that this patient who stopped a Uh, oral anticoagulant, let's say dabigatran or a warfarin, some days, three days or four days earlier, or maybe some antiplatelets. What are my chances of this patient developing an AF on table? They are very high, so I would put it as a thirty, forty percent risk prediction. Thank you, Puna, for uh, responding to that question. There is a comment from Vaishali who says that Euroscore gives an idea about morbidity and mortality, mainly for anesthesiologists to prepare. pay for the case and secondly for medical legal reasons so that uh, you can discuss with the patient rel and relations i think that's absolutely correct and i agree with that statement and uh, if any of the panelists or speakers wants to say anything uh, please uh, do that after that we will be saying good bye for today yeah with the, with the yeah, permission of uh, yeah with the permission of kanji sir uh, i would like to welcome you all for the actacon 2022 Don't laugh because <laughs> home Iran is no, getting. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But we will definitely have a conference at Madurai. No doubt about it. And I. Physical problem, sir. I hope you are coming. Shows tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Physical shows too. You did not choose Feb and you chose March end. Yes, sir. Yes, madam. Yeah, yes, madam. Yes. So we all are waiting for it. Yeah, definitely. Please, please visit Madurai and uh, arrangements. Everything done, Paka, and we are waiting for that uh, Omicron to settle down very quickly. I, I think it will settle. So, uh, as for the yes. current situation, we are going ahead with the conference in March 25 to 27 at Madurai. At, uh, the venue is Marriott. Uh, scientific schedule is completed. All the arrangements has been almost done. So, welcome you all for this uh, Actacon 2022 at Madurai. Sure, Thank you. There'll be no jelly cut to. No? Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. There'll be no jelly cut to. We can do. We can arrange, sir. No problem. Yesterday only finished all jelly cut to finish. Jelly cut to happened already, sir. If the, the, everyone is ready to participate, I can arrange jelly cut also. No problem. <laughs> we need some surgeons then. We need some surgeons then for that. <laughs> yeah, no. Problem. They're also available. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mulidhar. Thank you so much to ICM. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I should end this session. I think bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Mulligar. After uh, putting up such a good uh, webinar, arranging everything, arranging the speakers, and uh, all the speakers have done a great job. You are done. But to all the four speakers, uh, I must say that it was a wonderful job that they have done. And uh, Dr. Benjamin, particularly, uh, all the way he connected uh, with us for this uh, uh, with, for this webinar, uh, he spoke very well about uh, ESA classification and how it helps us these days. Uh, Dr. Amarjan Agri on risk scoring for non-cardiac surgery. Good talk again, and uh, then Dr. 
Dr. Deepak Bode for uh, uh, cardiac surgery. And uh, in the end, we can't do without uh, ICU. And uh, that's where Dr. Pooja Murthy uh, did a wonderful job with her predictive scoring. Uh, you know. And of course, all the uh, moderators, uh, Councilor uh, Dr. and uh, Dr. Manjula Sakar, of course, uh, for uh, you know picking up the questions and discussing uh, very well. Thanks to all the participants who asked questions uh, because that's what shows that uh, whatever has been said by the speakers has been retained. This I mean, and and they have very critically uh, assimilated every information that they have uh, given. And for me, who is a non-cardiac person, there was a lot of learning. And thanks personally also uh, to each one of you. And uh, at the end of uh, uh, it all, uh, a big thanks to all. And uh, till we meet again next week, thank you so much and good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Dr. Jay Shri. Thank you so much. Thanks thank for coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Thanks, everyone. Thanks, sir. Thank you. See you again sometime next week. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, sir.